what is a Buddha? Is a Buddha the enlightened one or awakened one as described in the ancient texts? Is becoming a Buddha based on experience, some kind of enlightened aha moment where suddenly you say, oh yeah, I'm the Buddha, then move on to your morning coffee? Or is becoming a Buddha a process, a journey, a way of being or seeing, a philosophy, all of the above? My name is Don Thompson and I'm a filmmaker, playwright, and Buddhist in progress. The idea behind this short video essay is to reflect about the lives of unconventional spiritual masters we might call rebel Buddhas. I'll use as an example a teacher I studied with personally, Rama, Dr. Frederick Lenz, inspired by his biography by Liz Lewis entitled American Buddhist Rebel as well as by the words that Rama spoke in my own experiences with him. I studied with Rama over 20 years ago, and to say the least, his approach to spirituality raised a few eyebrows, right up until his death in 1998. In many ways, he paved the way for the evolution of American Buddhism. Rama received his PhD in literature, but only after traveling to Kathmandu and snowboarding in the Himalayas. His adventures were detailed in the book, Surfing the Himalayas, that became a bestseller in the 1990s. There he met a Tibetan Buddhist monk named Master Fwap. Master Fwap would teach Rama how to meditate and about how to effectively incorporate meditative practice into his daily life. I've come up with seven signs of being a rebel Buddha, and Rama, to one degree or another, reflected every single one. rebel Buddhas break the rules. First, they can tend to blend traditions, blending the traditions of Hinduism, Buddhism, or perhaps even American Indian shamanism, or Wall Street business computing and finance and all the belief systems implied there. They can live like a Westerner, run multiple businesses, support gay rights, throw dance parties for their students, or drive fancy cars. They might be avid in various sports, have relationships. They won't necessarily take vows, shave their heads, give up material things, or wear robes, whether that be the robes of Buddhism, Christianity, or Hinduism. This will often upset the traditionalists who will most certainly conclude it is impossible to be spiritual and to be all of these things. And yet, Rama was all these things, and more, in an attempt, I believe, to meld American individualism and entrepreneurship with Buddhism and become a living example of what our human potential is. By doing this, Rama broke with tradition and completely upended expectations as to what being spiritual means. According to Rama, meditation is key to this process. Meditation is a radical practice, the most radical practice I know of, he said. And in order to meditate, to really meditate, you have to be a revolutionary. Meditation did more than change my life. It revolutionized my life and continues to do so. It made me happy. It gave me control. I became a straight-A student uh, all the way through college and graduate school, essentially. It allowed me to do things very quickly. I wrote my PhD dissertation uh, in about five months. Most people take several years, and it was a very good dissertation. It gave me a command over the powers of my mind, over my emotions, and more than anything, it made me happy. And I still today am the happiest person I've ever met.
Travel Buddhas are often fluid. This can be reflected in several ways. They might, for example, change their spiritual names, dress differently depending on their mood or message, experiment with different lifestyles. Rama went through a phase where he changed his own spiritual name. He wore so many different hats and personalities that what the real Rama was became hard to decipher. One woman who attended a Rama seminar put it this way. There's no pretense, the woman said. He is fluid Zen. Her husband explained that there were different degrees of enlightenment and that Zen master Rama was the most advanced teacher they had met so far. I have a koan for you. It's me. It's my Versace suit. It's the ancient world of Japan, Tibet, and the Orient. What do these two things have in common? On the surface, nothing. A koan is a meditative device that we use to expand our awareness field. The idea is quite simple. There are two things that seem like they have nothing to do with each other. But if we contemplate them long enough, if we find an interrelationship, we go to a new level of mind, a new level of understanding. And that level of understanding will not just reflect in that situation, but in all parts of our lives. In asking most people on the street about the term emptiness in Buddhism, they just might give you a blank stare. According to Rama, emptiness means you can let life teach you. It means you're open to life, he said. To do this, he would suggest allowing ourselves to be a beginner. A full cup cannot learn. The more water poured into it, it simply spills out. An empty glass can be filled with love and knowledge. The Tibetans also considered emptiness to be the nature of reality. According to the Heart Sutra, form is emptiness. Emptiness is form. Okay, that sounds interesting, but what does it mean? According to Buddhist masters, including Rama, it seems to mean we we're never really here to begin with. A disturbing thought, but also a liberating one. If we are not here, all of the various concepts of the world have no hold because they also are not here. All of the hatred that is based on these concepts can end all of the endless wars. What is left? In a world devoid of our precious concepts, this is perhaps the question we fear most. If everything is empty, what am I? Where am I? Who am I? Enlightenment is an awareness of emptiness. That is to say, enlightenment means you take your mind and you merge it with what in Tibet we call the clear light of reality, the dharmakaya, the essential light, the essential matrix out of which all things come. Doing that places you in the center of the circle and at the same time on the perimeter and at the same time no place at all. It doesn't make much sense logically. You experience reality in all of its stages and formations. The universe is so ancient and it's so new and it's very futuristic. Rebel Buddhas are funny. Rama was often hilarious. I remember at one meditation meeting where he walked into a room of rather somber looking students and, while holding a briefcase, yelled, Honey, 
I'm home. Funny for a rebel Buddha means don't take yourself too seriously. It could always be worse. Life may be a joke that God is playing on us. According to Rama, being funny can help eliminate our obsessions. We break off obsession by laughing at ourselves, by learning to be funny, he said. To me, the great cosmic joke may be we are already what we seek. Rebel Buddhists tend to push your buttons. Rama definitely pushed the buttons of his students, but they usually appreciated it. Because Rama mentored his students to take on careers, many of them would not have otherwise considered, careers that both paid well and strengthened the mind, they made large amounts of money, and after Rama died, often donated to charity or other good causes. Some of his students went on to have a broad impact on American society and business. Pushing buttons can happen in a variety of ways. Rebel Buddhas might ask us to look at things from a different angle, confront us with life's inherent contradictions, overcome our self-created limitations. By doing this, Rebel Buddhas can teach us humility. They can teach us to put others above ourselves, to look to something that transcends the often contradictory nature of ourselves and our world, to accept and actually embrace these contradictions. To sum up, when a spiritual teacher pushes buttons, they can teach humility, a humility that requires at its core forgiveness from the student both for themselves and the teacher. Rama had some good advice regarding any anger that might arise from this process. As he put it, forgiveness is the best revenge. Rebel Buddhists tend to find nirvana in the world. This is another view on the Heart Sutra, that emptiness is form, that nirvana is the world. Because they find nirvana in the world, rebel Buddhas can show us how to live and work in the world with a sense of lightness and play, all with a sort of knowing wink. How? Because that what we actually view is not here. It is an illusion, more like gazing into a mirror than anything else. What do we find in a mirror? A very real looking image. But is that image real? The image is a reflection of light. If our mind is like a mirror, could we be reflections of light? A mirage of sorts. Rama would say the mind is like a river. Where is the river? The water is never the same. It is always changing, a flow. Rebel Buddhas help us notice that life is like a river or like a mirror. Can we find the water? Can we locate our real image? Some might take an image, hang on to it and shout, this is real and it may be for them. But some of us still question, is it? So what I sought to do was to take the power of meditation, the power of Eastern philosophy, and integrate it in a way that it would be useful to a person who goes to work every morning, who lives in a Western society, who is uh, part of the media culture that we are all in. And I think I was very successful because people appreciated that. They really wanted to learn how to meditate. They wanted to learn how to feel better. They wanted to learn uh, how to essentially get some level of control of their time and life, but they wanted to be materially successful. 
they wanted to have a career, uh, have a family, uh, whatever, everybody's different. Rebel Buddhas are feminists. Because of this, they tend to go against the grain of traditional religions that are still more or less patriarchal in their structures. As feminists, rebel Buddhas insist that men and women be treated equally, promote the enlightenment of women, and insist that women are innately as powerful, if not more powerful, than men. Rama would be very pleased that women are taking leadership positions in governments and businesses around the world. In fact, he would fight the patriarchy. Historically, the Mahasiddhas were the iconoclastic, pro-feminine Buddhist mystics of a prior age that reacted against the rigidity and empty ritual they found in stagnant spiritual traditions. According to Keith Dowman in his book about the Mahasiddha tradition, the Mahasiddhas were never able to compromise their radical attitudes to orthodoxy and they maintain their ideal of existential freedom at all costs. Dhamman goes on to explore numerous examples in history where the Mahasiddhas, the great adepts, including women, would defy social norms and conventions in order to convey their non-dual, enlightened perspective where the divine feminine plays a crucial role. Rama was very much like a Mahasiddha and very much a feminist. To return to the question posed at the beginning of this essay, that is, what is a Buddha? If all Buddhists are on the path to Buddhahood, and to become a Buddha is to become enlightened, Rama saw enlightenment very much as a journey. Enlightenment exists within everything. There's nothing that can be separate from enlightenment. But when I talk about enlightenment, when I discuss it with my students, I am referring to an experience, a journey, the journey to light. 